preaching and just so you guys are uh, ready and challenged to just kind of see what the, the Bible would have for you and what we've been doing. So you guys can open up to there. I'll read the Ephesians passage. You can just sit and listen and then we'll let's pray really quick and then we'll, we'll go right into it. Father, I do ask you would help us to hear over these weeks, Lord, these, these hard commands that you would have for us in Scripture. And Father, not, not because they would be those things in which leave us in despair, but Father, that they would be those things that challenge us to be conformed to Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we are not a people here seeking co- to conform ourselves uh, to, to some outside standard or some written ro- uh, rule or record. Father, we, we are here to be imaging Jesus Christ. That is what we desire. And Father, we oftentimes fail to recognize that that means we must be confronted with hard things. But Lord, you're good to your people. And those things always come to meet your people with joyful obedience. And that's what we would ask you would give us, Lord. A joyful pursuit and obedience to these commands. Father, that we would know that they, these things don't make us righteous, Lord, but they do make us like Jesus. And that's what we want to be. Father, help us to be like Christ. Help us to be like your Son. Who else will we follow, Lord? Help us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Ephesians chapter 4, 32. I'm not going to read that entirety of that section. just want you to hear the last verse and then... Uh, give you a little bit of introduction to what we're doing. So Ephesians 4, uh, verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. Now, the reason I'm, we're going to jump off of this and go into Matthew 18, I'm going to do my best to give introduction to this. Nick might have a little bit more to fill in. Um, but we're starting something the next couple weeks. I've just said, are the hard commands of Scripture. We're going to be looking at things that the Bible would give us as Christians that normally if you would read something like this, Ephesians 4.32, it would just seem to be one of those cliche gospel verses, right? Be kind to each other. Be tenderhearted. Forgive one another. God in Christ forgave you. And it sounds beautiful, and it is beautiful. But if you were to slow down a little bit, and you were to pour over what is actually expected of Christians from that verse, it should at first scare you. You shouldn't come to the verse and go, oh, great, that's easy. Because because let let me ask, are you able on the drop of a hat to forgive as Christ forgave you? That should be the question that comes into your mind right away. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. All these things being wrapped together. Here's the package as God and Christ forgave you. And I think if we were to slow down a little bit, we would understand that is a hard command. And it is that. It's not a suggestion. And this also isn't an indicative statement of some state of being that Christians just magically flow in. This is, this is a command. Brethren, this is a command because we are not prone to be kind to one another. We are not prone to be tenderhearted. We are not prone to forgiving one another as in the way God forgave us. And God is kind to us. And God is tenderhearted and forgiving to us. We may do these things easily, but not the way that God and Christ did them to us. And so if we, are, if we were to step back and look at some of the things that Scripture would have for us, we would recognize that there are going to be commands within the New Testament. And let me tell you, a, there is a plethora of these commands. And we're going to simply run through a few of them over the next couple of weeks. And I just felt absolutely, I, I, I mean, I changed everything I was doing on Friday. I, I wanted to do this. Um, and I'm not exaggerating. You asked Nick, you asked Manny. Uh, but I, I chose it for a reason, brother, and that's because every time I, I, I hear as 
God in Christ forgave you, it draws me to a point in my life as a Christian where bitterness was rooted deep in my heart because I had not forgiven another brother. Hadn't. And it was, it was, it was detrimental to my life, not only as a Christian, but in being around the people of God, of being able to act in a loving way towards the people of God, being tender-hearted to them. And it was Matthew 18 that broke me of that rebellion and of that sin and of that wickedness. And but brothers, it was it is one of the most glorious verses. And if you've been a Christian in here from sometimes, you know that there are verses within the Bible that though all of scripture is sweet, that it, this is like your midnight snack you kind of put in the, you know, in the cupboard that's just for you. You turn to it. It's like the feelings and the, the smells and the taste and the moment become real again. And you are thankful that the Lord was kind in his discipline and kind in his reproof to show you your sin and to change you. And brother, this is one of those texts that I, I can say it in the most cliche way was life changing. And I want it to be for you. So that's going to be what this series is. We're going to be looking at hard commands of scripture. And I, I want to kind of, just by way of introduction, to get, kind of make an example and point out a few things to kind of show you what we're going to be doing and then how it's going to apply with this sermon today on forgiveness. So as, as we're thinking about hard commands of scripture, there's, there's a few things that I think we want to do with this. And you, you'll hear more from Nick and Manny as we go on who could probably add to this, but at least my initial thoughts and at least what I would want you and want us as a church to have is just a few things. Why do these commands come to us? And I think the first is, well, we have to recognize that they do, right? It does us no good that from the, if we start out from the beginning and we just assume that these commands don't come to us, right? We can read the Bible in a very superficial way where all we look at is historical context, who the original audience is, and we don't ever realize that God's word zooms past all of history and still lands on us. It still comes to us. So we need to first recognize that there are hard commands in Scripture, and they come to us, church. They come to us as God's people. So let me give you just an instance of this. Let me give you an example. So you think about Jesus in the Gospels confronting the Jews of his day, and I think by that extension is going to confront anybody who, like them, were, what were they convinced of? They were convinced that they were righteous, that they themselves possessed a self-righteousness because of their adherence to Moses. So Jesus confronts them, and he would confront all of us who would seek to, to attempt to justify ourselves by self-righteousness, and therefore before God. And what does he do? He raises the bar for them, right? They have this, they think it's high, like, they're like that high bar jumper who's really cocky and he's about to, if you don't know what that is, there's a bar and a guy jumps over it. He's looking at it and he's going to go and he's going to jump over it. And then he's like, you know, he thinks he's really great. But then the professional comes along him, raises it up a, a whole nother, you know, 12 feet and then jumps it and then makes him look foolish. And that's kind of what Jesus does. They think they're great. They think they're, they, they think they are perfect when it comes to obeying the law. And Jesus raises the bar and what does he tell them? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Period. You will not. You will not dwell with God. You will not have Jesus Christ. You will not be of his people unless your righteousness can exceed that of the most righteous people of the day. That's what he says. So he gives this hard command and he raises the stakes with it. You won't enter the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness exceeds that. So we can understand that what Jesus is seeking to do here is a few things, right? As, for, for, as this example plays out, what, what are some of the things he's seeking to do in doing this? Well, he, he's seeking to establish the fact that if you are to enter the kingdom, then you must possess a righteousness that far exceeds that, which is humanly possible. 
And you think of the Jews of their day, they are the embodiment of God giving his law to the people and them trying to keep it. What other, I mean, what other group of people were they to look to to think there's righteousness, right? There, there's the standard. It's set before them. And yet he says, no, 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 no. If you would seek to be righteous, your righteousness has to even surpass that. An unobtainable standard. Perfection. He's setting the standard where it must be. Perfection. So first thing he's doing, he's just setting the standard. Here's the bar. Here's where you got to jump. You can't jump. So second, he's attempting to point people away from establishing their righteousness before God by what? Their own righteousness. The goal of setting a bar high is not that they would just back up a few more feet and then run towards the bar as fast as they can. It would be to set it so high that you're thinking, I can't jump that. And what am I supposed to do? The, the goal is to set them up to fail. It's purposeful. Setting up to point them away from the fact like, if that's the standard, then I, I need somebody who can do it. That's, that's the whole point. He wants them to look away for themselves. And that's, that's Jesus Christ's text. He, he doesn't want them to think that they're worthy of the kingdom of God if they think that they can jump over that pole. They can't meet that standard. They're not worthy of it. It must be perfect. But, but Jesus doesn't leave them there, right? So he gives this hard command. He sets the standard. And it's to point them away for themselves. But then he doesn't just stop. The hard command doesn't change. It still comes to them. And it still comes to them with a standard that seems unattainable. But Jesus Christ is also seeking to show himself to be the source of that righteousness standing at the, in their midst. It's like, it's like the guy who comes along on the field and they're all staring up at the bar going, we can't do it. No way. We need someone who could, but there is no one to do it. And he's looking at like, oh yeah, I've done that before. And they're just not hearing him, right? He's standing right there offering himself to be that perfect righteousness and they don't see it. Because what does Jesus say right before he tells them that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom? What does he say? I have come to fulfill the law. Every jot, every tittle, until heaven and earth pass away, I've come to fulfill it. He's pretty much saying to them, I can do it. I'm that source. So right before them, there is the solution to their, their problem. There it is right before them. He tells them this. But it doesn't also end there. Now the command for their righteousness to see exceed that of the Pharisees is not grounded in their own. It is grounded in Jesus Christ. But what then follows that command? How to live a righteous life, not like the Pharisees. What do you do when you pray? You go out into the street and lodge your prayers. You pray in secret. You'll be rewarded. What do you do when you fast? Do you show yourself to be all beat up and bruised and tired and just sucked of nutrients? Or do you make yourself seem to be like you normally would? So, so brethren, the, the command doesn't simply come to point us to Jesus Christ. Yes, that is the pinnacle, but it, then it, it moves on. It's to move us forth, I think Jesus does there, is to have us live a life and pursue holiness that would not be driven by self-righteousness, but would be driven by Christ's righteousness. And that's just one of dozens of example. And the reason I wanted to do that is just simply point out to you that there are many of those commands in Scripture. And they are multifaceted as to how we are to understand the commands, how we're to look at them, but also how we're to take them honestly. Because what we don't want to do is, is, is push it off to one side and say, well, he's just holding up an untainable standard. You look to Jesus, move on with your life. But the command is also not there to be a burden. Paul would not tell you, pray unceasingly in the Spirit, if it would be a burden upon the Christian life. He would not tell you to have genuine love for the brethren if the genuine love was not a genuine love that would produce joy in your life. And same thing, brethren, God would not call you to forgive one another and be kind and tenderhearted if the forgiveness wrought in Christ was not something sweet to the lips. It just wouldn't be the case. So we, we have to avoid those things. Both of them are terrible ditches, and the church often goes to the first. We just look to Jesus, and then we forget the command. But it's a command, brethren. It's not just an indicative statement about what Jesus has done. 
He expects a life conformed to that command. You're not righteous. Look to me for righteousness, but then pray like this, fast like this, interact like this, do this. So I don't want to spend all my time on that because that's pure introduction. But we can't minimize what we have before us in this command here, that we are to forgive one another as God and Christ has forgiven us. And here's kind of the second point for us, as we said. The second point for us doing this is not just to know that there are hard commands in Scripture, but we got to be a people who are reflective and who are thoughtful about these commands. They should be ones in which we do wrestle with. They should be commands that come to us, and it's, it's not like my kid's puzzle of 15 pieces. I got that thing in a real jiffy. Like, it's easy. It should come to me, yes, with directions, but with a box of 500 pieces scattered everywhere, and now my task is to wrestle with it and to put it together so that I would see the picture clearly. But we, if we're not going to be a people who are going to be reflective on these, then we might as well be the people who just go, yep, look to Jesus, and then we look past the command. Rather than we'd be wasting our time, but we need to be a people reflective on these things, thoughtful on these commands. They come to us as God's people, and they are meant to conform you into something. That's what they're meant for. And in and, and church, we, we, got to, we, just, we can't be a people who are afraid because the Bible would call that a coward. And we can't be people who would look at it and just go, oh, I've given external obedience to forgiving my brother. I don't hold a grudge, a grudge against him. And then you go on with bitterness rooted in your heart. That is a self-righteous person. And if we would not think about these rightly, that would also be a lazy person. And let me tell you where all three don't enter into the kingdom. All three are not in the new heavens and new earth. All three do not find their place in God and in communion with his people. They don't. They don't find communion there. They will not be found in the consummation of all things. So we need to avoid those things. We need to run from them. We can't do those. Our end is the kingdom, brethren. And as we read, Jesus is going to describe the kingdom as a kingdom like this, as forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. So as we read these things, as we go through these things, I don't want us to be paralyzed by fear. I don't want to be paralyzed by doubt or uncertainty as what God would have to say to us. We've not been saved unto, unto fear. If, if, the, if the scripture comes to you in a fearful manner, church, you, you ought to look at that and be, and be concerned. These commands have not been given us for us to be a people controlled by fear. We've been a people saved unto joyful obedience, obedience whose source is faith, and the fruit is just us walking with God, conforming ourselves to these things. I want us to be characterized by that. So that, that gets us then to this one. How do we deal with this command? Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Kind of what a command to start with, too. I guess start with a bunch. And I don't think there's a particular order that would scale them. They're all, they're all commands. They're all serious. But which one gets to the heart of the Christian gospel more than saying, forgive each other because God in Christ has forgiven you? That's the only way you know Jesus Christ, because you've been forgiven. Forgiveness is at the heart of our gospel, of the good news that we proclaim. So this one, man, what, what, what a command to start with, but this one is going to go deep. Deep, brother. This one is going to go like a well. Like you drop a penny in a well and you just, you don't even hear it hit the bottom. So deep. But, brother, if you, if you would be a people, if we would be a people that would just let the word of God do what it does and we wouldn't stiffen our neck to it, the, the depths it would plunge, but the, the water that would come up from it, the, the life that would flow from it, the forgiveness that would be have in the heart. We wouldn't be able to describe it. So we need, we, need, we need to come to this and think, okay, Lord, what, what would you have for us in here? Forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Pause. Forgiving each other as God forgave you. How do you do that? How on earth do you forgive as Jesus Christ forgave? How do you do that? Is that possible? Is this command even something attainable? 
brothers, I want you to know that it is. And it's an expectation of the one who has received forgiveness. So flip now, Matthew 18. This is where we're going to be camping out. We're going to, this is going to be a very quick exposition of this because this thing is very cut and dry. That's what I love about a parable. It really just explains itself. We got to go do deep in the weeds, no uh, Bible gymnastics, nothing like that. Aerobics, excuse me, not gymnastics, aerobics. <laughs> This one is going to be no, not, not, not a lot of stretching. We're going to run and get straight to the point. But I want to get to the point because I want to get to the, this one is going to press us as we consider what often comes up in our hearts. Because I'll tell you this, you read this and then you think about the command. And I guarantee the first thing that comes in your heart is not a heart with arms wide open to just wrap yourself around the end of this promise. It's not. It's not mine. I, and I... Look, I know, I'm, I know I'm bad, but I know I'm sitting in front of bad people too. That's why we're in church. So I know that when this comes to you and you hear the story, it, it's, it doesn't come to you for you to look yourself in the story as a good guy. You're not the king for giving debt here, right? It, it's supposed to come to you as the one who would be warned that if you don't have a forgiving heart, there is a consequence to this. And it's indicative of your own state before God. So let's read it, we'll go through it, and then I want us to get to the point. I, I, want us to, I want us to start putting flesh on this. I want us to be pricked and to be wrestled by this. So Matthew 18, starting 21, read to 35, just going to read straight through, make a few notes here and there. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21, here's what Jesus says to his disciples. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay... His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant? As I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I would, I would want to begin this by going straight to the end. Here's where the challenge lies. Forgiveness from your heart. And no doubt, this is what Peter's question is somewhat beckoning, right? Right here at the beginning, right? These two things are tied together. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And then Jesus' last word, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, my father will do the same to you as he did to that wicked servant. Those things are tied together in this parable right here. But I want to walk through a few of these things. I think this thing's kind of broken up into real four easy scenes. There's a question that's asked. There's a standard that's assumed. And then there's a standard that's given. And then there's pretty much the whole parable to us. But then the, the end has that warning that will prompt us into, I think, what we need to start considering with this kind of command. And I think the blessing that is implied in the warning. So look at me with verse 21. Here's the question that Peter brings. And this question actually comes because 15, if you just go up a few verses and 
I don't really like the headings, but hey, here it helps a little bit, right? There's a chain, there, there, there's subjects here. There is, if your brother sins against you, and now this one is called the parable of the unforgiving servant, but what I would just entitle it to make it easier is say, what do you do when your brother sins against you? So there's, if your brother sins against you, and now what are you going to do if your brother sins against you? And so Peter's question comes here. Because he's, he's, Jesus has just told them, look, if your brother sins against you, you got to go tell him. There's nothing that happens, you got to bring some more people. Go tell him. That still doesn't happen, you bring it to the whole church. You tell him. They still don't do anything, you're going to treat him like a, a tax collector, treat him like a Gentile. So three times, they got this threefold witness coming against this person. And here, it, good old Peter, I I'm, I'm feel so bad for Peter, because this would be me if I was Peter. Right, Peter is just like getting set up by God all the time to say something really dumb. And Peter's like, okay, I'm going to raise it. I'm going to like it. Oh, go over double in my question with this. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? So, so you notice now the change in the subject is not on the person sinning. It's on the person who was sinned against. And so Peter wants to know, okay, we're to approach that brother three times. So how many times does this thing have to go on and continue in order for me to extend forgiveness? Even seven times? Like, I'll go for the Hebrew number of perfection and of just, uh, of just going all out. And he thinks, I, I think in his mind, that's a very humble thing to say. I just doubled what the expectation was. Like, not only will it be three times to approach a brother if he's not willing to be, you know, reconciled, but I'll even go seven times. Well, seven times, Lord. Is that how many times I ought to go? And obviously, Peter thinks this is a lofty standard because if you think of like the prophets, often what, what is some of the judgments on, on the people? Like you think of the book of Amos. Go read Amos and see how many times the Lord is counting sins. He says, for a third and then a fourth and then a third and a fourth. And all of these nations, including Israel, is judged after all of these witnesses against their sins, a third time, a fourth time, a third time, a fourth time. And you have to think, Peter has probably also grown up around a bunch of teaching that says something along the same lines as two. You know, multiple times, but then after that, psh, they've gotten what they've owed, right? They, they, they're going to receive what they've, been, what, they, what they've been building up for themselves. And so Peter's like, okay, let's raise it all the way up, Jesus. You say three, the prophets say three and four. Some of our rabbis say the same thing. Let's double it and let's go, to, let's go, to, let's go all the way to seven. And Peter thinks he's putting up a lofty standard. And is this not just like what he warned back in Matthew, like what we introduced with about being righteous? People think to just move it up just a little bit higher, the standard just a little bit higher here. And notice what Jesus is going to say to him. And he's going to set the standard. And this is going to be huge in him setting the standard. So in verse 22, Jesus gives him this reply. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So, a few things here I want you to know, because the parable is going to be quick. But I want you to pick up on a few things Jesus says, because where else does, but does Jesus talk this way about, you have heard it said, which is kind of implied in this, I don't say to you seven times, as some others might say is the implication, but I say to you, actually, if you were to look and then translate that, it would say, I say to you 77 times, that's what it would, that's, that's, that would be a better translation of this instead of it being in a negative. But the context, he's putting it forth as, as a negative. I don't say to you this because this is what others say. I say to you 77 times. And where else does Jesus say something like that? I say to you. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. And what do we get in Matthew 5? Flip to 21. I just want you to... I want you to get a taste of this because I want, you, I want you to understand what Peter is saying based on what he thinks he knows and what he thinks he understands the Old Testament to be saying and then what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't just revamp what Peter thinks the Old Testament says and he doesn't just revamp what the teachers of his day may have thought. He actually goes beyond it. He's going to go beyond the teaching of the day. He's even going to go beyond what Peter is looking to in the Old Testament. He's going to go beyond the Old Testament right here. So Matthew 5, 21, you get some of these same things. 
You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, and then he goes on to give them all of these commands. And if you notice in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus quotes a few commandments that we should all know, right? Hopefully we all know the commandment, shall not murder, or another commandment as in you shall not uh, steal or something like that. But he doesn't just pull commandments from like the Ten Commandments. He pulls from the Old Testament and he pulls from the teaching of his day, of their understanding of the Old Testament. And I don't want to get deep into the weeds on this, but when Jesus says, you have heard it said, he's actually referring to that, to the Old Testament. So this is not just some bad understanding that these disciples here have of the Old Testament. He's actually referring to it. And he's saying, you've heard it said before, from God's mouth, but I say to you, and he raises the standard. That's what he does. It's not just don't murder. It's if you hate your brother in your heart, you've committed murder. You're already a murderer. And he goes beyond what the law would prescribe for them. So what do we get in Matthew 18? Do not say, I do not say to you seven times, or to translate it, but I say to you 77 times, you are to forgive your brother. So Jesus is coming in with the same radical break and the same radical standard being propped up for forgiveness as he is to what the Christian would follow in their life when it comes to law. I mean, you, you, should, you should pause to think about that. This would, be, this would be something to think like, okay, that's cool. But if you think about the implication of that for the disciples, that would be like, whoa, you just told us to ditch everything we've known before. And he's like, yes. That's what you ought to do. The law is not the guide. Jesus Christ is. And here, the standard of forgiveness is not the rabbis or the Old Testament. It's Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. I don't say that to you. I say this to you 77 times. And now you're probably thinking, okay, maybe that's why he read Genesis 4 at the beginning. That was a weird text to read, right? Genesis 4. But here's the, here's the connection. In Genesis 4, what does Lamech say about his revenge that he is going to bring about on people? Wicked Lamech, by the way, right? This, this guy comes from Cain. Cain's not a good guy in Scripture, right? There's the righteous, and then there's what we call the seed of the serpent in the Old Testament. To be a serpent, to be a snake is not a good thing. So what does Lamech say his vengeance is going to be marked by? A 77-fold vengeance. A vengeance that is unbridled, that is untamed, that spits in the face of God. Because God's God's original verdict about a seven times punishment would be to vindicate someone he said he would protect. When Lamech says it, he does it in spite of God and he raises it higher. I'll take vengeance on whomever and whenever I want. And I think Jesus is drawing off of that to show himself to be the one who sets the standard. I say to you 77 times. In contrast to the wicked, in contrast to the world, even in contrast to what you have heard, I say to you, and brethren, we better perk ears up on that. Jesus is telling us this is the standard. And here it is, 77 times. Now, you can argue all day why he says 77 times. I think there's a link to that. Is it a 7 times a 70? Is it, you know, doing all the math? You do all the math all you want. What's the point? <laughs> It's a lot, and it's more offenses than you can count. I don't even think if I asked one of you in here, you could give me 12 offenses in the past 10 years. You'd be hard-pressed to remember them, because you're forgetful, because you're finical in the way in which you try to hold on to things I, in the same way. So the, the idea is just simply to say, unlimited forgiveness. That's the new standard, unlimited forgiveness. That's the standard being put forth. So Peter's water, or <laughs> Peter's question is just being completely blown out of the water. Seven times, Peter? No, Peter, I don't say that to you. I, I say to you 77 times. To which I think Peter would have sat down and been listening at this point. Okay, what do you mean, Lord, 77 times? And then here comes the parable. So here's the example. Verse 23. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. So notice right away, the kingdom of heaven, brethren, is marked by this. Seventy-seven times for the forgiveness, unlimited forgiveness, is the marker for the kingdom. So if we are to, if we are to be a people who are entering into that, who have entered into that, and who are seeing it unfold, that is what he's saying. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven. This is the standard. So here's this king. He wishes to settle accounts with his servants. And what happens? Verse 24, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. I don't want to spend too many times on the details in here because the end is the end. And the end is the, the, end is the punchline. But notice what this man's being forgiven of. The amount of debt. You may have a, a note in your Bible that kind of gives some rough estimation on this or what, what would be in reference to the debt. But just to get out of Bible talk and just to be straight layman forward talk, it's a lot. Like, it would be like you having to owe the total national debt of this country by yourself. How many jobs are you going to work to pay that off? Right? You, you can't. This debt, the money that was lent to this man that he has not paid back, was an amount that is beyond exuberant. It is an amount that is unfathomable to the human imagination. And notice the servant's reply. He knows he's in trouble. He knows the weight of his debt. Who else falls on their knees but the one who at least is smart enough to understand, my debt's pretty big to this guy. I better do something to be rid of this debt. And so he falls on his knees, but notice what he says. I will pay you everything. No, you won't. Brother, the... This man is, is being set up for you in this parable to point to us and to remind you that debt that you owe to God is if you come to it thinking, God, I can for sure pay you back. Just let me try. You're as foolish as this man. And he's being painted like that on, on, on purpose. Have patience with me. I'll pay you everything. Well, that patience is going to wear thin. Because he's going to be shown to be a man who can't even become close to paying this debt. And this master knows this. Look at 27. He says, out of pity for him. This is the kind of pity where it's like, you look on the dog that's hurt and you just feel so bad for him. I mean, you're just, you're not going to kick it to get out. You're going to like gently pick it up and set it down and let it be on its way. I mean, th this kind of pity is just, it is just pitiful, just sorrow for this this man who has showed himself just to be completely unaware of the debt that he owes. But he releases him, brother. He lets him go. And he didn't have to. When it says his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made, that is not an injustice being done here. This, is, this king that's being presented here, I would argue, is not being presented as a wicked king as other parables. I think this king is representative of Jesus Christ. And this king has every right to sell him and his family off to pay that debt. Every single right to do so. So his dropping of this and letting him go out of pity is to display the degree and the magnitude of the pity and the love that this master has. Because I think about, I think about some of these big CEO types and they lent you like a billion dollars and you squandered it and then they come asking for you to owe. They're not acting this way. Someone who lends you an amount of money to that scale, they're coming for your head. Nobody lends out that kind of money and is just, I'll let it go. The world doesn't work that way. Not at least with the wicked, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way with the wicked. And so this man should be, a, we should be thinking, this master is no ordinary master. This master is one in whom could have pity on someone who should be pitiless. Zero pity for it. But 28. 28 is the display that this man is a fool. 
But when that same, that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. So notice the scenario is almost exactly the same. There's a debt, except this time, this guy who's trying to act like a master goes after this man. He seeks to rip and to extort and get the money out of this man by any means that he can. And what does he fall down and plead? And why do you think this servant would have fell down and pleaded? Think this, this man would have known? Hey, this guy who lent me a lot of money, that dude owes a lot of money. And I heard what happened to him, and he got let go. Maybe, maybe he'll understand. My, my situation is way less dire than him. A couple hundred denarii, I mean, that's three to four months' wages, but brother, three or four months' wages or the national debt of a country, I'm taking three or four months' wages, right? That's what I'm taking. So he's probably banking on this idea. This guy has got to get the point that if I plead with him too, he's for sure going to let my payment go. And he doesn't. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. And his fellow servant pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. And then there's no more commentary. He refused. And he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Let me ask you, how's a man to pay the debt if he doesn't work? I mean, this man is in the same predicament as the other man, but if he would have let this man continue to pay and would have, had, would have pitied him and have mercy on him, even to the slightest degree, he would have had his money back. But no, this man has no pity. This man has no indifference for him. This man has no love in his heart for this servant. But when his fellow servants, verse 31, saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, he, his master delivered him to the jailers or the torturers until he should pay all of his debt. Brother, why do you think the story would end without some kind of, and he remained in jail forever, forever, and ever, the end? Because naturally, that's the case. This man's not going anywhere. And in fact, the fact he's being put into jail with torturers until the debt is paid is to now describe the agony that this man will now feel until his unpayable debt is paid. That is, that is the end to this. And then here comes 35, and this is the part where you should be pricked. This is not the part in which we go, oh, great, good thing I already do this all the time. Yay, we can move on. No, 35, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, no exception here, every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. For then that would be the point of this. How do you forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you? Well, the first place you begin is not in your outward conformity or your pleading or anything else. It is forgiving your brother from your heart. And therein is the challenge of this command. This is what we ought to have to be wrestling with right now because the standard is there for forgiveness 77 times. This is the kingdom standard. Everyone who's in, who enters in by the gospel to this kingdom, here's the standard. And the result of this forgiveness should be what? You forgive. What's the result of forgiveness? It's always forgiveness. What's it not? Law. And it ought to free us to forgive. But 35 is to remind us, we are not the forgiving master. We are the servant who 
would strangle and choke and hold someone in contempt because they owe us something petty and little when our sin mounted up and yet we pleaded and were forgiven, but we don't offer the same forgiveness for somebody else. That is the point to this. And so the challenge for this, for this command, we need to wrestle with how we can begin to forgive our brothers and our sisters and people in our lives from the heart. Because that is where for forgiveness begins, and it's also where forgiveness is going to end. Forgiveness does not just end with you speaking the words. If you leave after saying, brother, I forgive you, and if bitterness is rooted into your heart, then forgiveness has not been given. The words don't matter to God. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't need to sound perfect. If you haven't forgiven your brother from your heart, it doesn't matter how elaborate it is. It doesn't matter if you wrote it out in a two-page letter. If you have not forgiven from the heart, you may have fooled the person in front of you. And you may have fooled everybody else, even yourself, but you didn't fool God. Because who sees the heart, brethren? My, my, he says, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive from your heart. Who sees into the heart? God sees from the heart. Christ knows the hearts of men. He knows what they come to bring to him. And they also, he also knows what we come to bring to each other. He walks amongst his churches. He's no fool. So we must wrestle with this command, church, that we are to forgive one another as God and Christ forgave you. And how did Christ begin to forgive you? Well, I'll tell you what. He did it from the heart. And I know that because how replete is the Bible with passages like this. For God so loved the world. Loved it, brethren. Romans 5. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And, and then the, the example given. Some may die for a righteous person. Some may die for this person. But no one's dying for the wicked, ungodly person. But Christ did out of love. And secured that forgiveness before you were even his. You're an enemy. Forgive, forgiveness was secure. It wasn't just a hypothetical. It was actually secured for you. Forgiveness ready for you before you knew Jesus Christ. So forgiveness must begin the same way that God began and forgave us. God is not sitting up in heaven holding out indifference and bitterness to those who have sinned against him. Yes, God is just, but of course, brother, God is just. He'll punish sin. He's not a chump. He's not a guy who just sweeps it under the rug, but he is not like me and you who when we're, when we're wronged and a sin's been committed, he heaps up bitterness and a wrath and an indignation to just simply strike you down at a moment's notice. No, he actually, what is he holding back while he's holding something out. It's love. It's forgiveness. It's ready. It's available, which is why the command for any and all to come is always a real offer to people. It's because forgiveness, and I'm going to say this, and I'm the guy who probably wouldn't say this, forgiveness is ready in God's heart. That's the, that is the implication in this. You need to forgive your brother from your heart because the way God in Christ forgave you is forgiveness was ready for you. Purchased, won, done. It's ready. The forgiveness is right there. And it wasn't waiting upon your performance. And it wasn't waiting upon your perfect repentance. And it wasn't waiting upon you falling to your knees and pleading with this great master whom you owed a large debt to. No, brethren. Forgiveness began with God. And it began within the heart of God and his love for you and his love for the world before. For you were his. That should tell you where forgiveness ought to begin. And that should attack what immediately is already coming to your minds, excuses. And I have the same ones. I'm telling you, here come the excuses. And, and here's one of them. And this one seems harmless. Super harmless. There's no need to forgive. Whoa. Well, it's, it's okay. There's no need to forgive. It, 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 we, just, we can all forget about it. And now look, look, sometimes we say that and it's really because we have no offense. 
The person maybe thinks they offended. They really didn't offend. They really didn't sin. And so we're just, it's like, you know, it's our cultural cliche that we use. There's no need to forgive. It's okay. But I would say this, that is often not the case. It is often the case that when we say that, because I know it in my own heart, it's like, I, I'm just testifying to you my own sin right now. Like, if I say, if I've said that to you, it's probably because I really, in my heart, had something where I was offended and I just wasn't honest. And you know it for yourself too. You know you weren't being honest when you probably said that. You know you were sweeping it under the rug. And oftentimes we are quick and quiet to overlook an offense that has actually happened, but that it's actually not been forgiven. And here is the, here's the cop out. It's all right, brother. There's no need to forgive. It's, everything's so good. And yet bitterness, pff, right in the ground. And you may think nothing of it. And you think nothing of the seed as it goes into the ground. But you give it time. You give it water. And you give it the reins of indifference. And you give it the reins of bitterness. And what is going to sprout up in your life? Hate towards your brother. Indifference. And then what will happen with the next offense? Will you be quick to forgive? Will forgiveness be stored up, ready to go in your heart? You better believe it won't be. You're going to be like a microwave, and it's going to instantly come up, and it's going to be hatred. It's going to be indifference. It's going to be partiality. That is what's going to happen if you let that excuse come in for real forgiveness. If there's no need to forgive, and yet you know there's an offense, and yet you know there's bitterness in your heart, then why on earth would you be content with some lame, cheap, plastic imitation of forgiveness? Why would you? It's free, brethren. It's unlimited for a reason. We got a full supply of it. It never ends, and guess what? It's free. The forgiveness is free, not won by you, not purchased by you, free and ready to give. And we're fools to think, might be a lot to do that. Might cost a lot. Might make a lot come out from my personal well-being, whatever the case may be. And we trade it for something cheap. And that's the danger. For them, like we said, just because the words come out, there's no need to forgive. God knows your heart. We may not be able to see it. I can't see it. But I can tell you, I know your conscience testifies to it. And know for the fact that God sees it. So what else would cause you to want to not do something different? Someone else finding out? Well, brother, that's not godly repentance. Either. That's worldly repentance. We need to repent of that excuse that there is no need to forgive when bitterness has actually crept in because of an offense. We must root it out right at the beginning. We must grab that seed. I don't care how far you got to dig into the ground. And then you cast it out and you guard your heart from that coming back in. You don't let it seize opportunity. So brethren, God knows your heart. He is watching. He knows. He's not a fool. And he's also not vindictive against his children. He's a good father. But just like when I know my son, hey, buddy, did you go get a snack from the playroom? Nope, and there's crumbs still all over his mouth. I'm not a fool, brethren. God's no fool either. He's not. So don't allow that cheap imitation to be an excuse for real forgiveness to take place. Because I'll tell you what, that one comes to you then like it came to Peter. Right? This is no longer on the person offended. It's you. You got to deal with it. So here's the second one you got probably thinking of. I got a number of these. Because this is one that comes to my mind. Well, forgiveness has to be asked for. And brethren, this is the one that I think has crept in in teaching that is the biggest excuse we will give for why when a... Look, the, the other one for little offense is okay. You know, your kid popped my kid and you didn't say nothing. All right, I, you know, I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll even forget that happened. You steal my car? You shame my family? You cause me to look bad in front of my peers. You lie about me. You steal from me. You think little of me. You treat me differently than you treat other people. Brethren, I I guarantee you this one comes to mind first. Oh, forgiveness has to be asked for before I can give it. I want to give it, but it's got to be asked for first. Brethren, whose attitude is that? I'm going to forgive them, but first got to come ask for it. Well, of course. 
Of course we had to come and repent and receive forgiveness, but God wasn't going, no forgiveness until you do it. It was held out to you first while you were an enemy. You're shooting back at God, an enemy, and he's going, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm holding out forgiveness. Just come and receive it. And you're like, no. <laughs> Why would you do that to somebody else? They got to come ask for it to be forgiven. Brother, that is a lie. That is taking a theological truth and turning it into an excuse. And it turns it into excuse to be caught in sin. Yes, you have to ask for forgiveness to receive that forgiveness. But what are you receiving? Did you receive forgiveness? Did God go, okay, now I can make that forgiveness. And here, here you go. You got your forgiveness. But it was already there. You simply received what he already held out to you. And the same goes for us. Forgiveness doesn't need to be asked for for us to already go in and forgive our brother. It should already be in our heart, ready to go, ready at a moment's notice. Your brother comes to you and he falls like the one who owed very little, pleads with you. You ought to be ready and willing and at the drop of a hat forgive. And if you can't, brethren, I'm telling you, that is a sign you actually don't have forgiveness in your heart. None. You have bitterness, and you just better own it. It's bitterness that you've placed in your heart. You've dressed it up as forgiveness, but it's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is already ready to forgive. It's already there. It's already been done. And you think about this. This is the one I think, this is one I think Peter has in mind. Because when Jesus tells him before, you go to your brother when he sins against you, and you tell him his fault, we're all like, Heck yeah, you tell him his fault. And if he doesn't listen, you take it to more. And if he doesn't listen, boom, we kick him out of the church. And we all like that standard. And there's a reason to like that standard, right? We need a standard within the church to conduct our life. But bro, that's how you deal with somebody in sin. How then do you deal with your own heart? Well, what's assumed when you come? What is the intention and the goal of going to your brother? Reconcile to win. If he listens to you, you have gained, or I would say you have won your brother. Do you win somebody by going in with no forgiveness ready in your heart? Because you probably think, well, I tried to go to them. I asked for forgiveness. They just, they didn't want to have any, they didn't want to have any of it. And I guarantee you it's because you said it like that. Why? Bitterness drove that, not love. Forgiveness was not ready in your heart. Wrath was ready to go in your heart. Brother, the, the assumption of even going to your brother in sin, how do you win your brother in reconciliation? Forgiveness has already been made in your heart. It is ready to be dropped like that. So that if your brother were to recognize his sin, he is simply receiving what you have already offered in your heart. You see that? You see what we're imitating now, just like God and Christ forgave us? So be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. From that excuse, that theological jump, that garbage has to go. There may be a slight truth to receiving forgiveness, but to give it, that is not true. To give it, it doesn't simply need to be asked for. It should be given in your heart already. It should be ready to go. So we got to throw that out. Forgiveness should be ready to go in the heart. And this leads kind of into the third one, and it's tied. Well, there's got to be justice to be had. And I get that feeling, right? The prophets, a third time and a fourth time, and judgment will not be withheld. That's a righteous standard in Scripture. It is. But who gets to give that judgment, brethren? You or God? See, when you allow justice done simply for the sake of justice and not love, that's what results. Not real justice. Because what is God's justice driven by? Pure justice? Pure wrath and indignation? No. What does every single confession throughout church history attribute to God in his attributes that is not attributed to him into his attributes. It's love, not wrath. Wrath is a response, but love is always attributed to God as an attribute of his, and it's what drives his justice. He loves his own name. 
It's love that drives it. And his own name doesn't just resound, brother, I'm sorry, I know we're a little reformed in here. It doesn't only resound in wrath. It resounds in reconciliation. It resounds in forgiveness. It resounds in wrongs being made right. Not just punished, but actually made right. So the Bible would paint for us then that the person who has justice must be had can have forgiveness in that heart is that they miss the point here. They miss the point that Jesus is dealing with them in this passage. Because that man had that in his heart. He did not understand forgiveness. He had no clue what forgiveness was, though he had received it. And the reason he had no clue is because he wanted his own justice, not driven by love, not driven by repairing something, not driven by reconciling something, not driven by seeing somebody made whole, but by pure wrath and by pure indignation for the person. But if you think about this, brethren, about bringing something to your, to your brother and the goal is to win them, if, like Jesus says, this is the standard marked out for all of those who would enter the kingdom of heaven, then we have to wrestle with this difficult command, but not unattainable. Not unattainable. Because what should have, how should the story should have gone? A great debt's been forgiven? Now what, what should have he gone and do? He should have gone to the next five servants that he has and said, I forgive you of your debt, your debt, and your debt, and your debt. A jubilee, which in the Old Testament, everyone who owed, everyone who was a slave because of being sold off because they couldn't make a payment, it's let go, made free. They, and not only that, but they're returned to something greater. Their debt is not just cast off. They're actually given something back. Did not Jesus Christ do that for you? Did he not just forgive you of your sin and get you out of your payment of what you owed to the Father? Brothers, he gave you a righteousness. He gave you, he gave you an inheritance. You are a co- You received way more than what you bargained for when you pleaded to God for forgiveness. And by, by God's grace, thankfully, he, gave, he gives those things to us. <laughs> Brethren, if we don't see the story that way, then we can't begin to deal with all of the circumstances in life that would challenge us to think, I need to forgive my brother from the heart. I need to forgive as Christ forgave me. Because I know you have more questions. I know you have more instances. I know you have more specific examples. And I can't answer them all. But I can tell you where it begins. And I can tell you where it ends. In the heart. If you can't come with forgiveness. And you can't leave with forgiveness. It's not there. And the way that you get there. Is not by trying harder. It is not by raising it up like Peter. Maybe I'll just... I'll, I'll forgive a few more times. How about that? That'll get me there. Loving my brother. And it won't. It's like raising the bar to be more righteous. You can never raise it high enough. You're to look first to the one whose debt you owed, and it was beyond unpayable. It damned you, brethren. It damned you. And rightly so, it damned you. But you were forgiven, and it was wrought. Even better than this mess, it was wrought while you were still an enemy and while you still hated God. And then it was offered to you. And that was what you came to Jesus Christ for. That's who you saw him to be as that great and loving Savior and Redeemer who offers to those who do not love him that kind of forgiveness, an unlimited forgiveness, a forgiveness that covers a multitude of sins. Because God's love is not contained. It is not dictated by law. It is not set up for you to simply write down and to check off and to perform. It is something for you to look at. Brethren, if you are looking at it rightly, if you're seeing it rightly, if your heart resounds to it rightly, then forgiveness will not be difficult. Oh, maybe sure, for times it will be difficult, but it's not because the command is difficult. The command ought to come to those who recognize that they've been forgiven. because. It, 
to look at that, this at the end, you might be thinking, well, that seems kind of like a contradiction, Aaron. You're telling me forgiveness is unconditional, and I'm to forgive unconditionally. But there's a condition here. Yeah, and it's for you. That is the heart that the condition goes out to. The condition doesn't matter to the person who has forgiveness ready in their heart. The condition doesn't matter to the person who understands the debt they've been paid. The condition matters to the person who says, but he owed me. That's who the condition is given to. My heavenly father, our heavenly father, will do to any one of you if you do not forgive your brother in your heart like that man did. So there's no contradiction there. We are the contradiction. God's forgiveness is unconditional, and it ought to be met with unconditional forgiving from the heart. And brethren, that's a thing that it ought to land on our hearts easily. And if it doesn't, it's not because God's word is in contradiction or hard or something that we can't grasp. It's because we are a people who do not know how to grasp it. Brethren, forgiving from the heart, though it seem like the highest standard, because it is, is something that is attained not because you work, but because Christ worked. That great work is the motivating factor. It is the thing driving you the entire time. And it makes forgiving from your heart possible. Seven times? Seventy-seven times, brethren. And that is what the kingdom ought to be marked by. Let's pray.